Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, uh, we're all about uh, connecting classrooms around North America uh, with science, adventure, and exploration, uh, conservation as well. I'm very excited for our guest today, Chris Scarf. I'll give uh, a brief intro. So Chris is a, a filmmaker and conservationist. He's worked for a wide range of broadcasters and NGOs, including the BBC, HBO, uh, World Wildlife Fund, and Conservation International. Uh, his work, he, he likes to educate and expose wildlife crises around the world. And he's just returned from a, a month of filming various projects across Madagascar. So, uh, Chris, how are you doing today? Very good. Nice to meet you all. All right. Very excited to have you joining us. Uh, we have four classes joining today. And I'll introduce them right before the Q&A session. But Chris, I'll let you take over because I know you've got the good stuff. No problem. So yeah, nice to meet you all. Um, as Joe mentioned, uh, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker. Um, basically, I started out um, really sort of by default um, at university. Um, but I, then I had to pay off some student debts. And I ended up... Um, working looking for historical shipwrecks. Uh, so I spent two and a half years doing that, looking for sunken treasure. Um, and during that time, we actually had a film crew uh, that was making a documentary uh, on the work that we were doing looking for shipwrecks. And uh, my boss didn't want to give away the position of the shipwreck. So I was given uh, an underwater camera uh, and housing and basically left my own devices to film. And ever since then, um, I've been working all over the world, covering a whole range of environmental stories. Uh, everything from uh, shark finning, um, seal culls, um, turtle slaughters in Bangladesh. Um, so yeah, a real wide range of uh, different wildlife stories. Um, and as uh, Joe mentioned, I've just finished a shoot for Vice Television, uh, starring uh, Michael K. Williams. I don't know if any of you have seen The Wire or Boardwork Empire or the movie 12 Years a Slave, but he was the presenter. And the idea was to look into black market trades uh, from all over the world. And I'm based in Cape Town in South Africa. And here we have uh, a type of sea snail called uh, abalone. I don't know whether any of you have uh, seen, seen an abalone before, but I'll just show you a, a couple of pictures. If I can get it to work. Are you guys seeing that? Or are you still seeing my face? Yeah, it didn't load, Chris. Try the, the green icon again. There we go. There we go. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Right. So this strange creature that you see here um, is uh, an abalone, as I say, uh, and it's a type of sea snail, uh, mollusk, and you find them all along the seabeds here in South Africa. Um, they're not very appetizing, um, well, they don't look very appetizing, but in China, they're actually a very high-value uh, product, a little bit like uh, shark fins. Um, it's really part of the sort of uh, growing financial power in China, that uh, sort of the high demands and the growth in the, the economy there means that countries such as South Africa are being uh, targeted uh, for, these, for these mollusks, for these sea snails. Um, and this has resulted in a lot of illegal crime uh, occurring. You have lots of people sort of poaching all up and down the, uh, the coastline here uh, in South Africa. And uh, yes, you have people going out in small, small boats uh, along the coast, as you see here, and just picking up uh, they can pick up even tons uh, in, in one night, um, and it's a real game of sort of cat and mouse uh, between the sort of police and the poachers themselves. Um, and this is this has resulted um, in a huge, what is now a huge industry, um, which is supplying the market in China. Um, you do have other forms of... Uh, of uh, legal farming, you see here one of the large aquaculture farms uh, in, uh, in South Africa where they, where they actually harvest and grow 
uh, the abalone, but the problem is they take so long to grow to a, a large enough size uh, where they're sort of commercially viable that uh, unfortunately more and more people are taking them out of the oceans and it's the same problem as we've seen uh, with um, with shark fins and sea cucumbers, um, that there's basically an over harvesting of this crop, and uh, yeah, numbers are numbers are being reduced, and we're seeing we're seeing less and less of them, unfortunately. Um, when when we when we were making the shoots, uh, we actually got uh, incredible access, and uh, we managed to go uh, undercover, and actually to to go out with some of these poachers and see how they operate at sea. Um, Actually, pulling up the abalone and the sale of the abalone. I mean, we're talking huge, huge prices here. Um, South Africa, as you probably know, is not a particularly wealthy country, and uh, yeah, uh, even at the base level, um, these guys, are, you know, can pull in maybe three hundred dollars in a night, four hundred dollars in a night, which in a country, you know, where you know ten dollars, fifteen dollars is a is a is a good salary uh, per day. Um, or even less than that, then uh, yeah, it's becoming a it's becoming a huge huge industry, undercover industry here. And of course, as you start to make money, then uh, more and more people are becoming involved. And unfortunately, there's a large gang uh, influence coming in now uh, that are coming in and taking over these some of these uh, fisheries, uh, some of these groups uh, of the guys who are trying to fish and catch these abalone. Uh, and this has resulted in a lot of crime. Um, a lot of attacks um, between the sort of rival gangs. Um, so yeah, this has been re really sort of quite a quite a big issue. Um, and I'm happy to um, uh, do a few questions and answers on this subject a little a little bit later. But um, as uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, I've just come back from five weeks in Madagascar, uh, working on a couple of different projects with lemurs. And Joe, if you wouldn't mind, uh, would you mind showing the uh, the short film there? I'll pop it up now, and Chris, you just let me know when you can see it. So I'll just switch over. There we go. And okay, can you see the film screen? Yep, looks like it's uh, ready to go. All right, there we go. Madagascar is home to over 100 species of lemur. These unique species are only found on this island. Sadly, over 90% of lemurs are threatened with extinction. They are the most endangered mammal group in the world. Our objective is to help lemurs and their habitat. Fire is the biggest threat to tropical roots. Seems to pause there. The video connection seems to have stopped at my end, Joe. I don't know whether you can see it.
All right, Chris, are you still there? Sorry, yeah, we lost video connection there. We had a blink. I don't know what side it was on. Did the video play? I played for the first minute or so and then uh, cut out at my end. It cut out. Okay, let me just check with the classrooms and see what they were able to see. Um, Mrs. Cowley's class, did that video play? Only half of it. It's hot. Only about half? Okay. I'll start part way again. Finish it. All right. So I'll just load that back up quick. And we'll start about halfway. There we go. Fire is the biggest threat to tropical deciduous forests in Madagascar. Within Ankara Ponce National Park, local residents are allowed to burn savanna areas to graze their cattle. The problem is that this burning can accidentally catch the tropical forest on fire, damaging lemur habitat and affecting people's livelihood. We plan to create a documentary to help educate people in Madagascar about the issues facing lemurs, forests, and the local residents who live in the national park. We need your help to make this possible. With your donation, together we can make a difference, helping save lemurs, their habitat, and improving the lives of local communities through education and employment. All right, hopefully that went a little bit smoother. Okay, great. Um, so as you can see from the, from the video there, um, there's a big problem in Madagascar uh, in terms of trying to balance the needs of communities and uh, the needs of the, the wildlife. Uh, unfortunately, over 50% of the natural forest has been uh, lost in Madagascar, and some people would say uh, even more than that, um, basically because you... Um, the communities are burning the land to then sort of cultivate crops or to um, to uh, graze cattle on, and there's less and less land basically for any of the animals or the species uh, to survive on. Um, so, what we're seeing is uh, national parks, like you just saw there in the, in the video. Um, all the land around them is being cleared out, uh, and now there is. Um, very little space for the for the animals to, to remain on and uh, that's why it's so important to protect uh, these kind of parks. So we spent um, two periods now in, in Carafants National Park uh, which is in the north of Madagascar uh, working with local communities uh, to try and create an education program um, which is beneficial both to the communities and to the, the animals themselves so to try and make it a win-win really. Uh, and I've done sort of a, a lot of sort of similar projects along these lines. Um, I've done a lot of work in Mozambique uh, with uh, with shark finning, um, which is for those of you who don't know, is basically a process where the the shark is harvested, and they cut off the fin, uh, and then that's taken to China to be used in uh, shark fin soup. I'm just trying to pull up some pictures to show you here, but it doesn't seem to be obliging. Not sure why that's not working. Do you want me to try on my end, Chris? I have the copies of the pictures too. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, if you could just go into um, the Dropbox folder and pull up uh, photos outside the 19th one. There's, uh, you'll see there's a few pictures there of uh, me with various sharks underwater and my, and my colleagues. Sure. So under photos, and is it the one wildlife? I uh, know it's in there. It's in the other Dropbox folder. There, there's there's two sets of folders. There's one for um, um, for the previous files I sent you, and there's one for the for the ones I sent you today. Okay. Just bring those up. So yeah, just while Joe's pulling those up, um, yeah. So the the problems that we again we see with shark finning is uh, similar to the abalone. There's a big demand in China uh, for the shark fins. Again, we're talking hundreds of dollars 
uh, for a bowl of soup. And this has resulted in countries all around the world uh, targeting shark populations to feed this demand. Um, so um, we, we basically went and lived in a series of shark camps uh, up and down the coast uh, in Mozambique. Uh, we documented the everyday life of the, uh, of the shark fishermen and the communities there um, to see why they, why they were catching sharks. In fact, um, we asked them the question of what they thought the shark fin was actually used for. And not one of the shark fishermen out of the hundreds we met up and down the coastline actually knew that it was being used for soup uh, in China. Um, most of them thought it was used for um, lining the boats. One guy even thought it was for the metallic strip that you see in, uh, in banknotes. Um, and so, yeah, we, work, we worked with these communities with a, with a sort of series of sort of... Uh, NGOs and charities to try and change the way that um, people were fishing uh, to give these animals a better chance. Are you winning there, Joe? Yeah, Chris, just went to the Dropbox. This was the ones from last year. I must have cleared them since then. If you just ah, maybe try share screen again, maybe the green, yeah, it worked the oh, yeah. second time. So let's see if it'll go. There we go. Yeah, it's working again. There we go. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is this is to give you an example. There, there, there's myself um, with a with a large shark. This is sort of worth uh, a lot of money to the fishermen. Again, like I mentioned, with the uh, with the abalone, um, you know, the average day, daily salary in Mozambique is somewhere around two year two year sorry two US dollars, uh, whereas um, a large shark fin like this, um, they can sell. Um, to middlemen for some for a set of fins for a hundred or, or more dollars, uh, depending on the species of, species of the shark. Um, so it's not only the the local fishermen that are doing this. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of industri industrial boats as well, um, and a lot of it's, they use different methods of of fishing. Here you can see with see me with my colleague and the presenter Carlos uh, looking at one of these large uh, nets. These are called gill nets, and unfortunately they're also responsible for a lot of a uh, lot of fish life. Um, basically, the the fishermen want to catch uh, either sharks or they want to catch um, uh, high value fish such as tuna. But what gets caught up in here is uh, unfortunately a lot of different animal life, everything from uh, fish as large as uh, sorry, uh, animals as big as blue whale, uh, as big as whales, or dolphins, or turtles, uh, which have no commercial value uh, to the fishermen. And unfortunately, a lot of this is uh, thrown overboard. Um, and unfortunately, this is resulting in uh, our seas basically being sort of uh, wiped out and uh, pillaged, really. Um, and this is like a big part of the work that I try and do, sort of working with government organisations and charities to um, to try and turn these kind of things around. So I don't know whether um, you guys have any sort of specific questions for me around any of the work that I've done or any of the projects that I've worked on, but I'll be uh, happy to answer any of those questions. Okay, perfect. So let me introduce our classrooms. We have three joining us, plus my own. So we have um, an eighth grade science class from Bowling Green Junior High School. Uh, in Kentucky with Mr. Hollis. We have Miss Hoffman's grade 5s in Toronto and we also have uh, Mrs. Cowley's grade 7s joining us from Sarnia, Ontario. So I know Mrs. Hoffman's class has a, a lunch scheduled coming up soon so why don't we uh, duck into their classroom and see if they have a couple questions for Chris. How's it going grade 5s? Okay. Uh, I'm Rachel. My question is, why did you start looking at animals, and what made you interested? Hi, uh, Rachel. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, basically, I, I grew up in uh, England, in the United Kingdom, um, quite a long way um, from any sort of uh, from the ocean. Um, not a lot of uh, sort of sort of big wildlife like uh, I've seen in other countries. Um, but uh, when I was small, my mom, my mother used to take me to um, 
a small uh, aquarium and I sort of fell in love with all the fish and things there. And then as I grew up, I got into diving and uh, sort of, yeah, my love of wildlife, I guess, came from, from, from being in the wild itself. And then in terms of conservation, uh, as well, I was working on the shipwrecks. Unfortunately, the way that we'd find a lot of the, the pottery, uh, which we were looking for on the old historical shipwrecks, were brought up by these huge nets, a bit like some of the ones I showed you in the picture, something similar to that. Um, and this sort of resulted in a huge amounts of bycatch, lots of dead animals uh, that they were targeting. And I guess that was kind of the light bulb, light bulb moment for me and why I got involved with sort of conservation and filmmaking. Okay. Good question. Do we have another one? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, can, uh, how many uh, uh, sharks are killed just to make that soup in a year? Um, it's people will say different different figures, but yeah, I mean some some of the quotes will say like from fifty to hundred million sharks a year. So it's a lot of sharks. And the problem is with um, catching these catching animals like sharks is that it takes them a long time until they can breed again and have uh, more young. Um, so because they're at the top of the, the food pyramid, unfortunately, um, if they're heavily targeted by fishing and they're overfished, uh, then you can quickly lose uh, species. That's why many sharks are critically endangered. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think I saw another hand near the back. Do you want to ask one more? Um, have you found any sharks dead in, like, the, uh, at the bottom of the ocean? Sorry, could you say the question again? Have you found any sharks dead at the bottom of the ocean? Yes, unfortunately, um, as part of the work that um, we did, uh, one of the fishing methods that they use are called long lines. And this is uh, sort of nylon lines with hundreds or even thousands of hooks, which can be like, the lines can be kilometers long. And what we would do is we would go and swim along these lines, and some of them would go along the sea bottom, some of them would be at mid-level in the water. We swim along looking for to document uh, dead sharks. Um, sometimes they were dead, sometimes they were alive. We actually had uh, one instance where we had a very large shark uh, in not very good visibility, um, which was caught on one of the on one of the long lines. And it's a bit like a, a dog on a sort of a long line or a lead. It was sort of swimming round in circles like this, obviously very stressed. Um, and as I was filming it. I mistakenly got moved by the current towards the shark, and as the shark came around, it actually hit me and just sent me sort of barreling out of the way. Um, and it yeah, just shows you the power of, of these animals. I mean, it wasn't trying to attack me. It was just stressed, and uh, I misjudged the uh, distance between myself and the shark. Okay. But, uh, yes, I have seen quite a lot of sharks dead on the ocean bed. Thank you. Um, did, for shark fin soup, did they cut off all of the fins? Yes, so um, different sharks have sort of uh, different amounts of fins and certain species are worth more than others. Um, on the large commercial boats, um, they tend to just cut off the fins because they have their financial value and quite often they'll throw the body of the shark uh, overboard because the actual shark meat is worth uh, a very small amount of money. Whereas some of the shark camps, which I mentioned, uh, with the sort of uh, poorer sort of fishermen, uh, local fishermen in Mozambique, uh, they would actually keep the meat and then sell that to the community as a sort of important source of food. Um, and then one of the things I don't know whether you know about sharks, uh, another large uh, marine species, is that they actually accumulate um, what's called methyl mercury, a type of metal which you get from industrial process, processes by man. And basically, it's a small fish gets some of this into its body. Every larger fish that feeds on these bigger fish as it goes up the food chain accumulate this methyl mercury. And this is actually quite dangerous for humans. Um, uh, most countries, including the US and Canada, will recommend that pregnant women, for instance, don't eat um, large tuna or shark or foods of this nature because of this accumulation of methyl mercury, because this can have a problems with your 
uh, with your uh, nervous system. Charlie. Okay, thank you. All right, let's grab one more question from your class. Um, I'm Ty. My question is, um, why do the shark fins cost a hundred dollars? It's really down to demand. Um, shark fin soup was uh, originally seen in the past in China as a, a food for the emperor, for basically the elite. Um, and as China's come out of uh, sort of uh, communism into a sort of a free market economy, it's meant that a lot more people have become a lot more wealthy in the country. Um, unless they've had this more wealth, there's a bigger demand for shark fin. It's a real sort of prestige uh, item. So I guess it's like somebody having like the, the latest iPhone or something like this you'd like you might have in the States or Canada there if you want to have a business uh, big business meal um, to try and attract clients or it's your daughter's wedding then you know as we might have champagne or something for a, a wedding there it's seen as the best thing you can have is uh, sharp fin soup uh, and that's really why the, the price and the demand is so high uh, because there's such a such a huge demand for this product Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, great fives, great questions. Um, stick around for as long as you can. We're going to switch to another classroom, but if you guys have to duck out for lunch, feel free. Um, Mrs. Cowley's class, do you have a couple questions for Chris? Yeah. Hi, my name's Ethan. What's your favorite kind of shark? Uh, yeah, my, my, I guess I would say my favorite kind of shark is the uh, tiger shark. You're probably familiar with the tiger shark because it's got a, a very clear clear pattern, as the name suggests. It's almost sort of a, a ti tigerish sort of shape. Um, and unlike most people think the sharks that they're sort of very aggressive. Um, actually, when you're in the water with them, you you can you can see each other. They're actually sort of quite curious, um, and will you know they'll come in quite close and sort of be around you and things like that. And uh, that's something I, I always always enjoy. And they're such a big shark. It's like they, some of them are like in excess of five meters, so yeah, it's uh, it's always a great shark to swim to swim and film. What's the best treasure you've had found? Um, yeah, I mean that's, that's a question I get asked asked a lot, and uh, a lot of a lot of people think there's. Um, a lot of gold on these wrecks and some of them that are. It's a little bit like you doing your shopping. Uh, I guess you take your money with you and on your way back you bring your shopping. Um, and a lot of the vessels that we found uh, were laden with uh, porcelain uh, which is known as white gold because it's, uh, it's actually value, pound for pound. It's actually worth more than gold itself or some of, some of the pottery items that they are. So we find a lot of different range of some really beautiful pottery. But the things that I liked the most were the sort of personal items, the items from uh, some of the crew, um, which gave you sort of a feel for the people uh, of, of that time. And we found all sorts of things from like uh, Chinese chops, which is what they'd use to sort of seal letters or uh, perfume bottles, um, sort of lots of private sort of little elements from the shipwrecks. And I guess I, that's what I liked more, the sort of the history and the backstories behind uh, some of these uh, items we brought up. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Where's your favorite place you've ever been? Well, that's a difficult, difficult question, Caitlin. Uh, so I've been to some, yeah, some incredible, incredible countries. Um, I think for, for, for diving, um, which is like I mentioned, what I really started out in um, Borneo in uh, Malaysia. Um, some of the best diving I've ever done anywhere in the world. You just see such an incredible range of uh, marine life there. So, yeah, I guess I'd have to go with Borneo. Hi, my name's Carter, and what's the most expensive type of shark? Um, generally, the most expensive type of shark is actually not a shark. Um, it's actually a type of ray, which looks very similar uh, to a shark. Um, and uh, it has two large fins on the back, um, which again uh, adds to the price, and apparently the, the taste and texture uh, is added to it, and these are called guitar fish or guitar sharks. 
Okay, maybe if you have one more, and then we'll move. We will to, we will uh, visit in with Mr. Hollis's class in Kentucky after this. I think that we uh, we're all out, Joe. Perfect. All right, we will visit Mr. Hollis's class. And this is a great class. How's it going, guys? Great. Good. Okay. I have a question. Um, how many species of lemurs are endangered in Madagascar? Unfortunately, yeah, there's the vast majority of uh, really all the lemur species are endangered or critically endangered in Madagascar. It's actually the most endangered mammal in anywhere in the world uh, of any mammal species. So, yeah, unfortunately, things are, are pretty bleak uh, for most of the uh, lemur species uh, in Madagascar and why it's so vital that we protect the environment uh, sooner rather than later for them. Um, my name is Joseph Boyd, and I wanted to know why would they want to burn forests for more farmland? Yeah, so um, it's a traditional method of um, of uh, farming, which they call tabby, and uh, yeah, basically it's the way they've, they've always done things. Um, basically, there was nobody in Madagascar. Uh, it's one of the most recently habited islands anywhere in the world, uh, I think 1,500 to 2,000 years. Ago and uh, yeah, basically, when there was very few people there, you know, this method of farming was very good, where you sort of burn and clear the land, and you know, you have a lot of fertility for a short amount of time, and you can graze your cattle or grow your crops. But as population numbers have have increased, and people have just continued continued to do this. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a very very poor country, um, and you know, it's difficult to convince people who are living sort of hand to mouth every day. Uh, to change the way that they, they farm um, if they can't see any quick and uh, immediate benefits. So, yeah, it's one of the, the biggest biggest problems we face is finding uh, alternative incomes and alternative methods to produce enough food for uh, a rapidly growing population. Um, do the poachers who kill the sharks, do they usually get in trouble for it in South Africa or do they usually just get off the hook with it? Sorry, did you, did you say sharks or the abalone there? Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Um, do the poachers who kill the sharks, do they um, get in trouble or are they usually like let off the hook and they're not very strict at enforcing the rule? Yeah, it, it depends from country to country. I've worked with sort of um, shark finning in a lot of different countries. Um, some countries have a lot greater enforcement than other, but yes, generally, unfortunately, um, at a local level where people fish from the shore, um, there's not a lot of prosecution, usually sort of poor fishermen, um, not a lot of good policing in a lot of these sort of poorer African countries. And then we have the larger, the big commercial boats uh, further out at sea. It's so costly um, for any kind of uh, patrol boat to get out there to check what these guys are bringing in. It's a lot of ways to get around these laws. So, yeah, basically, in a nutshell, unfortunately, yeah, the enforcement isn't good enough, um, even with the existing laws that we have to protect uh, a lot of shark species uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of the countries I've worked in. My name is Isaiah. How are you going to save the animals from the uh, sharks when people are harming them? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Are you going to save the sharks when the people are harming them while they're doing it? Sorry, what's the question? How, we, how, 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 do, you, how do you think we should save the sharks? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's for me, one of the, the best ways that you can change the way that uh, a lot of people eat, uh, particularly in the in Europe or in the States is by influencing the, the supermarkets and the way that they um, the way that they buy their produce so you're getting a lot less bycatch as I talked about so you're catching a lot of less amounts of bycatch of sharks and things when you're trying to catch tuna or in China where there's a direct demand for the shark fin product then it's yeah it's really got to be a process of uh, education 
um, to sort of turn around some of these traditional beliefs and make people realize um, what's going on. And it is slowly beginning to have an effect. Uh, I've got a, quite a few friends out in China and Hong Kong, and they say that the amount of people that will eat them at business deals and to uh, have them at weddings and this kind of things is being reduced. And this is largely through a, an awareness of some of these issues as you have more sort of television shows and things growing up in China, more of a sort of conservation sort of awareness. But again, this is like generations that have to grow out. Um, and unfortunately, um, it may be too little too late um, if we can't if we can't do more now because um, most most shark species have been reduced by uh, ninety percent from the sort of previous levels since industrial fishing started. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big issue for sharks. And if you take sharks out of the food chain, then this will have big knock-on effects on all the other sort of animal species further down that chain, and it sort of can have a a bad effect on the, the seafood we eat today. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Chris, just on my end. Um, the announcements just started, so it's going to be loud for about one more minute on my end. But uh, Mr. Hollis, does your class have any more questions? We have one more. Tyler? Um, I have one more question. Um, instead of how, like, how can we help in any way or inform other people that sharks are becoming extinct, the same as lemurs in Madagascar? Sorry, did you back up? Can you say that again? Um, like, how can we inform people and let people know that sharks and lemurs are in danger? And yeah, like, I, I think. Um, a big part of it is from obviously differs from country to country, but getting getting involved with uh, different groups that are uh, working on sort of different conservation campaigns. Um, I've worked with a whole different series of, uh, of conservation groups, and uh, I would advise you to sort of look in your local area, contact uh, people like WWF or Sea Shepherd or Blackfish. There's a lot of lot of people doing great work there, and see how you become become involved with them and. To spread the message of conservation to other people, become a filmmaker yourself. Uh, write to your local MP. Any of this kind of stuff is, is, is yeah, is, is really important. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Great question. So, I just have the announcements have stopped. So it's quiet here on my <laughs> end, and uh, we're just starting our lunch too. But I have two students who really, really want to ask a question. So let me just have them come over. Uh, how can people in Madagascar make more money? Yeah, it's uh, again a very good question, and it's, uh, it's a difficult one uh, to achieve. But um, one of the biggest problems has been political in instability uh, in the country. Um, they've only just started to have uh, officially elected government um, at the moment, and I think once you've got political stability, um, then you can start to improve people's lives. I think um, again, you need Different uh, different people to come in with different expertise in terms of farming or fishing, um, sort of education uh, of a whole host of different different methods of um, basically protecting the forest to move away from, like I say, some of the traditional sort of slash and burn farming. I think habitat loss is really the the biggest problem. Um, the government's been good in making a lot of protected areas. But it's then actually enforcing the protection of uh, some of these areas. Thank you. All right, and then I have Mackenzie with one more wrap-up question. What was the challenge of filming in Madagascar? Uh, biggest challenge is getting around the country. Really, um, it's a vast, it's a vast island. It's the fourth biggest island in the world, um, and a lot of the road systems are very, very poor. To give you an idea, to drive around 100 miles, um, which I guess you'd usually do in a couple, couple of hours on the, on, the, on the highway, on the freeway. Uh, it took me 17 hours um, over some of the worst roads I've been on anywhere in the world. So yeah, just getting to some of the locations is uh, incredibly difficult. Oh, okay. Thanks, Mackenzie. All right, Chris. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit of uh, your work with us.
Um, we got in in just the perfect amount of time because the classrooms had to slip out for lunch. But um, yeah, I look forward to checking out some more of your work and I hope to have you do some more exploring by the seat of your pants um, hangouts in the future. Great, yeah. Very happy to be involved and yeah, I wish you all the best for the next ones. All right, so I'm going to sign off for now, but if you want to stick around just for a couple minutes, Chris, we can have a little chat. All right, sure. All right, thanks, Joe. All right, thanks, thanks everyone, guys. for watching.